<clears throat> Howdy folks, let me just let everyone know we've started up. How is everyone? Hope you're all good. We have tea. I'm missing something. What am I missing? Some marbles. Right, let me know if the audio is good or if there are any issues. Uh, frame rate looks okay. Meters look good. A bit chilly in here. Heating's not on yet. Hi, Laurie. Thanks for the uh, feedback on the audio. Everything looks good. Whew. Been a bit of a bit of a rush, I'm afraid. So, what are we going to do today? Um, if you think we need to cover, I will go on to the graphics and memory. In a bit because it's an interesting discussion I said and I really need your help as well Laurie because I've got a few questions but um, before we do that uh, let me see if I can uh, I don't need that uh, hold on so I was going to just try something quickly. Hold on. Uh, I need to, I think I need to stash this. Hold on. We just try something here. Uh, I need to get this working. The um, so I need to find the ID. Let me open. So I currently have some changes here. I wonder if I can do that. I was just looking up. I, I need to go back to the main branch, but I don't want to lose my changes. I was thinking of stashing them temporarily, but there's another way that I just saw. Hold on. Just see if this works. Which uh, minus C, let's call this uh, flash.
Okay, now I need to get back to the uh, master, I think it is. This will work. <sighs> this is going to be fun. Uh, hold on. Let me just check. Branch we are on. Is it uh, just have a look? It's not good. Oh, <laughs> I've just done it on completely the wrong. Um, on the wrong code. That's going to really. Um, mess bear with me a sec Hody ho de ho. Uh, it's not doing what I thought.
I need to resort. Oh, I'm still on. Okay, I'm confusing myself now. There we go. Oh, I keep doing it in the wrong bloody window. How stupid. Is it minus F? Um. more healthy oh, no. uh, in case you don't know what I'm doing I'm just trying to we were working on some hard SPI using the SPI peripheral to check the flash out. I just wanted to back off the changes, but I wanted to kind of stash that in a new branch, which I think I've done, but I probably completely messed up the other project as well, which is very strange. Um, I've now created a flash test branch on my um, other, on the HGL project. Which I didn't mean to do because I wasn't in actually at the right place. Let me see what happens here. Error. 
could not compile black crab due to 19 previous errors. Oh no, no. I thought I'd be going back to something that worked. Damn it. Ah. Oh, I know why. I know why. Um, check out. What do I want to check out? Oh dear, I've checked out completely the wrong thing. I need to check out Probe RS. That's better. Let's see if we can build it now. Apologies for this, folks. Now, uh, what I need to check. Is let me just have a look if that's brought the USB up. Looking in the um, USB listings, definitely talking to the board. I should also bring the board up as I think about it. Hold on. Apologies. This is probably going to need. Um, Some adjustment, I shouldn't wonder, because I've been messing around. Brilliant, I know, but best I can do under circumstances. Oh, this is so annoying. Um, so why aren't we seeing anything on the USB? Let's just go through this. Bear with me a sec, folks. Apologies for that delay. I just wanted to get um, the old uh, software running. See what we're doing here. What am I missing? Um. 
I've got all the right pins by the looks of it. Okay, so what is it that I'm not doing that I should be doing? SPI spawn, manage spawn, shall I be running one of these? Manage, what's manage spawn? So, QSPI. And this is a transfer. I don't need to run those. And then something's not happening here. Do I have a pole status? Is that it? This isn't going to work, and then we get on with the discussion. So what happens if you try and do it in too much of a hurry? I don't quite get uh, why. Let me just check. is going to the right connector. That's powered. That is rather annoying.
Uh, it should run into the USB mode here. Do I need to do any of this? I don't think this is going to make any difference. Let me just... Um, does he manage to... Pretty sure this won't make any difference. Let me just enable this just temporarily. No, I don't think it's making any difference. Let me just check the USB. Now I'm not seeing anything on there at all. Um, that's a shame. Okay, well, sorry for the slow start. Um, what I wanted to do was just get something up on the um, screen. This one. But for some reason... Seeing it um, come up. Device halted by user. Yeah, no, I'm really. I'm missing something. Anyhow, let's move on and come back to this. Okay, so what do I want to talk about today? is the ILB configuration. I want to talk about memory. So I've got some questions. Um, I've got some questions for Laurie first. Uh, Laurie, with the retro stuff, what is the, um, the highest resolution of the retro stuff? and the highest colour bit depth that we need to support. That's my first question that will lead us into this discussion. This is actually pretty hard to get off.
It, um, Laurie says it rather depends on which machines we port. Some machines use 640 pixel width, but 320 or less is more common. So, 320. So, if we take the 320 case first, so that's 320 by what, 240 or something? Two forty or two fifty six, right? So, um, three twenty by two forty at eight bit is about seventy six, seventy seven k. Now, what is the bit depth? At three twenty two forty, what's the worst case bit depth? I'm, I'm just trying to imagine the worst case memory requirements here, Laurie, that's what I'm going through. Worst case or best case, depending on which way you look at it. Um, I should also get um, this up as well. Gonna need this in a sec. Uh, most of the black ice ports used four bit per channel. Bit bit four bit per channel. Do you mean four bits per colour? So I might be going back in time. No, I'm not. Yeah, four bits per colour. Now, eight bits total for bit depth is common. What, what I need here as well, just to explain, Nori, is I need the actual bit depth that it operates in, not the bit depth that we then represent that in, because I know in many cases we'll choose from a higher colour space. I'm talking about, in terms of the way that the system sees it, so the retro system itself, does it see it as four bits? It varies a lot. What's the worst case, though? So have you got your Atari 2600 working? Because that does something weird, doesn't it? Does that do like, what is it, four bit color with um, eight levels of brightness or something? That has a palette of 128 colours. Um, hmm. 
That's a slightly odd one, isn't it? So that's what, seven bits? 16 chroma values, which is four bits. No, four bits. Each with seven levels of luminance. So I knew it was something weird like that. Um, some machines choose from two, yeah. A 256 colors are obviously eight bit. So the worst case is eight bits, right? Forget the color range, just as far as, when it comes to store its, uh, its representation in video memory or whatever, um, then we're talking about eight bit, yeah. So I've just moved that chat window onto my big screen and it's tiny. I forget how uh, low res my um, OBS transmission <laughs> screen is. Well, was a... um, I think the 8 bit machine have a minimum of 8 bit depth in VRAM. So if we can assume eight bits, now ignore for the moment that we've got more colors to choose from in order to do the color corrections and stuff. Forget that for the moment, let's just keep it simple. Um, no, it says, but 16 bit machines such as the Amiga or Atari ST may have more. Yeah, I don't know how far we should go with this. So for the 8 bits, we're talking about, um, what was it, what was the worst case, 2, what did you say, 2, 320 by 256, was it? That's about 82k. Yeah. So to do those machines, we'd need 82k's worth of, uh, 82 bytes, kilobytes, sorry, 82 kilobytes worth of um, VRAM. I think, um, yeah, and then, Lloyd goes on to say, but 16-bit machines such as the Amiga or Atari ST may have more. I think those machines will struggle to fit on the IS-14. Yes, quite possibly. Um, so those will require 82K or whatever it was. You did mention another one where you talked about, what was it? Uh, horizontal line resolution of 640. What was that for?
uh, in practice, mo um, BBC Micro has a 640 times 256 mode, but that's monochrome, I believe. So 640 by 256, 640 times 256. That equals 163, 164K, but I need to divide that by eight, don't I, if it's monochrome. That's only about 20K, right? In practice, most 8-bit machines use the maximum value of 32 kilobyte of VRAM. Many are just 16K. Okay, right. Let's take that assumption then. Let's forget about 16 machines because we 16-bit machines because we can <coughs> come back round to that. Right. So I had a bit of a crisis with the design over the weekend now if you remember if you look at the diagram um, here on the left <laughs> oh I've got to get a video mirroring that'd be nice um, I made some small changes <laughs> excuse me but my issue here is the speed of this flash and PS RAM. For a lot of things would be okay, but when it comes to the video RAM, it's a bit of an issue. Now, if you remember also, I was talking about on here, on the STM32, having the SD RAM. Can I use my... Um, this one here and when I was going through this I had a bit of a crisis because I suddenly thought well what is the problem that I'm trying to solve here um, because we want to be able to run the retro stuff and we want to be able to run that well um, In order to do that, <laughs> the SD RAM doesn't come into it. This isn't required at all. Also, um, it turned out to be a bit of a nightmare in terms of pins, routing, and in terms of sourcing the chip. So I took a step back and had a think, and I thought, well, what's the real problem that we're going to be dealing with here? how can we solve this a bit better and then I started thinking about the STM and I started thinking about different chips and what I could use what may be the best thing for this for this in terms of a solution and I decided that the SD RAM was not even needed in the first place and it looked like what I was doing was I was just putting that there because I could. Um, the real problem was how we were going to do the video. And then I remembered a conversation I had with Ken probably a year or two ago. Uh, and we were going over possible um, boards that we could make for. Um, the retro market um, not in this sense but in a more generic sense and one of the things we talked about was how do we do you know if you had something really cut down like the RC 1014 is it the RC 1014 you know like the um, Spencer Z80 uh, cards with running CPM and stuff 
if we did a video card for that because this was one of the things we were considering among other other different things and that reminded me of some of the other functionally functionality that exists within the STM family now this is rather complicated as to what different members of the family support but this is my thinking what if you know what we're looking for here is effectively um, some SRAM and enough speed to display it. and I know for a fact that from the STM32 or certain cores we can actually drive um, all sorts of different uh, LCD displays because here I was thinking wouldn't it be nice to have a reasonable size display on the front of this that we could do all the bits and pieces rather than having to worry about interfacing to say VGA or HDMI or any of that stuff but that we could do the whole thing on an LCD that got me rethinking about the functionality of the STM32 and how we can um, how we can better use it. Sorry, saying Spencer's machine is the RC. Oh, two oh one four. Sorry, yeah, I got the number wrong. Two oh one four. Yeah. Um, And the more I thought about it, I thought is, well, the STM32 has quite a bit of fast SRAM. Can we use that? So just forget the details for the moment. Let's assume that our STM32 not connected to SD RAM here but is connected to uh, LCD okay um, and the sorts of LCDs I'm talking about here are parallel LCDs that may or may not have acceleration um, If we have that, given the amount of RAM that we have in the STM32, that would act as a frame buffer. It could also act as an accelerator as well, but let's, let's just leave it for one second. And remember that we have here this data bus to the STM32 because we wanted to be able to um, query the STM32, the disk, for example and we wanted to be able to um, use it to do um, updating of the flash as well as programming the ice 40 etc so the other way we can use this is the STM32 is pretty fast so if we're using the um, the example that I've got that I'm trying to route on the board right now the STM32 F7 that has um, I think it's about 250 260 let me just double check Tell you exactly how much memory it's got. Uh, have I already got this open? Do a quick check. Just look at the data sheet. Hold on. Uh, 
F7 freezing error, isn't it? Freezing error. So if I look at the data sheet, um, we have precisely, let me just scroll down. Uh, I can probably show you this. Here. Memory wise, we have 256k of RAM, which is broken up into different uh, banks. So we've got plenty of uh, memory that we can use in order to. Um, video RAM. Oh, that's really odd. Just trying to get that centered. So we've got plenty there. So if we take the 256k, we're talking we only need about 80k to do that, potentially. But we could use a lot more than that if we needed to. So Basically, because we have this 16-bit bus, um, here, what we can do is we can write data to the STM32. Notice, however, that the STM32, Although it has a 16-bit data bus to the ICE-40, it does not share the address bus, this 20-bit, or 21-bit actually, uh, address bus here. I'll come back to that in a minute. So what we can do though, is we can write uh, an upper word and a lower word, okay? So we can do a 32-bit transfer in two cycles. And the STM32 can react to those much more quickly than the Flash and the PS RAM. Um, and it can it can actually buffer those into uh, its own internal memory or the frame buffer. Laurie Griff is saying some retro machines had separate VRAM, it varied between 16K and 128 kilobytes, depending on model. Uh, some retro machines such as BBC Micro use some part of its main memory for video RAM. Yeah. So what we can do is, because we can use a two cycle, inside the ICE-40 here, it looks like a normal address and data bus. But what the, a bit of logic can do is it can take the address and it can split that into two parts a 16-bit part and an 8-bit which it combines with the 8-bit data okay so it can do two 16-bit transfers that gives us up to 24 bits of addresses which we won't need we can actually use some of those bits for something else and then 8-bit data 
into the STM just using two transfers. Now, I don't know what the maximum speed we can transfer that into the STM32 is. I, I, I don't know what the maximum read speed on that port is, but it's pretty damn fast on that F7. Um, two of those cycles will be faster than a single uh, PS RAM cycle. So this will be much more performant than the PS RAM, despite the fact that it's operating in two 16-bit transfers. That means we can write into the STM32, uh, we can mem literally memory map a section of the STM32 memory and then the code in the STM32 um, and or a combination of DMAs can literally take that those transfers put it into local memory and transfer it out to the LCD so basically we memory map a portion of the SRAM which is very fast in the STM32 over this 16-bit data slash address bus. Uh, that means we have an additional part of our memory map that includes uh, the VRAM. And then we partition appropriately for the retro applications. That is, I think, the best way of doing this. What do you think, Nori? I'm sure you've got some questions. And there's a lot more to this as well. There's a whole bunch of benefits, potentially. Where do you put the logic of turning the VRAM into a video signal? That's actually done in the uh, STM32. It's really just a bit of trickery. Memory trickery. VRAM is seldom a single frame buffer on retro computers. Yeah, I kind of figured that. The key thing here is this model works well if the memory accesses are mostly right to VRAM. I'm saying VRAM, it could be a section of the normal memory as far as the memory map is concerned. So the logic of reading the VRAM and generating the signal is different for each computer. Um, Uh, so the logic of reading the VRAM and generating a signal is different for each computer. Well, in all these cases, we're using the same LCD. Now, the LCD itself can actually operate at a higher resolution if we want to. Uh, and can include a whole bunch of stuff that's generated on the STM32 as well as that um, that's generated by the rights to the VRAM 
from the retro machine. So we can handle things like um, disk access, selecting images, putting text overlays, or having window in window, you know, on a high res screen. And then we can blow up, you know, the VRAM to whatever size we need to. Uh, it's not an issue of the resolution. No, I know it's not. There, There is, in most cases, I'm assuming uh, it's it's how pixels and colors are but but the color space can be mapped the output to the LCD is going to be probably 16 bit so we're going to take the 8 bit and we're going to color map it into the 16 bit color space It's how pixels and colors are represented. Yeah, that I don't think is an issue. The tiles and sprites for some computers. Um, I'm not sure how far we take that. You know, we can represent those tiles and sprites inside the STM32 and have it handle some of those. Or we can just lay it out as part of the memory that the uh, that the retro uses there are optimizations that can be had by providing sprite facilities etc and you know when we do our later our oh, risk 5 type retro stuff um, then it's going to take advantage of those extra features but those features pretty much rely on writing to memory of one sort or another and moving things around in memory right you know do we do we need to have some memory on the ice 40 side to do the sprites or do we do that on the STM side I don't know exactly um, we may or may not need to do that it depends um, even a simple retro computer like the Amstrad CPC had a very strange mapping of pixels and colors into VRAM and the support of multiple different modes I understand that line I do And that has to be um, done. The question here is how much of that is done in the, you know, the HDL and how much of that is done in the STM32 uh, code and mapping. There's a lot of ways of doing it. I'm sure there are. But the best way may be different for each computer. You may be right. I mean, I, I don't have the experience that you have on this, Nori. Obviously, the more we can standardise, the better. But clearly, the way that the uh, the VRAM, if you like, or the video works, uh, will vary depending on which um, which retro is being, um, you know, 
run at any given time. There would be different modes. I, I certainly expect that. Different video modes running in the STM. So it could make the port very specific to this machine. Um, yes, is the answer. There are certain parts of the port, the video parts, if you like, that will be, you know, optimized for this. Just switch so we can see what's going on here. Yeah, most retro machines had a de dedicated video chip. I'm not surprised by that at all. I expected that. But many of them work on very similar principles. The way they go about it isn't always the same, but... Um, in this table, the Amstrad CPC film, where you see the organisation of memory. No.
<laughs> I do like this. Seeing all of this information and this disorder, one can only think that the person who designed this was not quite in their right mind. <laughs> Lol. Um, Laurie saying, what you seem to be suggesting is moving the implementation of that chip to the SDM32. Possibly. I think in some of the more extreme cases, we'd have to do something clever. Or we somehow do memory mapping and translation uh, on the FPGA. It could be a bit on both sides, potentially. Um... Yeah, it is a bit bonkers. But I mean, you have to do it anyhow, right? Whether you do it in HDL or whether you do it in code, it has to be done. So it's just where you put, you know, put that and can it be split, you know, partially HDL, partially, um, Partially STM32. Uh, Lori says, yes, there are possible schemes that split the logic. There's a question of working out, you know, there might be a quick way and then there might be a optimized route. And those might not be the same. But I think it's all doable. But there is, of course, you know, quite a bit of work. It doesn't have to all be done at once. I mean, to a degree, you're having to do a lot of it anyhow. But you're having to do it in HDL. It may be easier to do some parts in on the STM32. Some other parts may be easier, you know, um, in the HDL. Also, the things that you can migrate to the STM32 will save you look up lookup table units and blocks on the um, on the ice 40 side so there are advantages to be gained and I know you're saying this is specific to this implementation but I can see that we'd be able to use this implementation in all of the retro designs Or all boards that support the retro, and I do plan other boards, but there would be both a code and a HDL base that would be more or less portable. Remember, we can, we're can we not stopping ourselves doing it the old way. We're adding in a feature, another way of doing it that, that will be available to us. And we can do it piece by piece of the various different uh, machines we want to support. But the benefits could be really good. Another way of looking at this is we're adding, you know, a couple of hundred K of SRAM into the memory map at a most fundamental level, but we can probably make it a bit more um, 
elaborate and useful than just a bit of VRAM, right? Um, thus, we can do all sorts of very cool and interesting stuff uh, on the new, you know, the RISC V retro stuff. You know, you can build in things like sprite support and that kind of stuff and basic primitives, drawing primitives, for example. It's just leveraging that extra resource that we've got on the board. So uh, I've just been pointed to this. This article has multiple issues, you know, of course. This list of home computers and their video capabilities. Oh, that's a good list. That's really useful. Really nice. Yeah, all in one place. That's really cool. There's another good reason for doing this. Remember on this, on our... Um, system we've also got uh, a USB I think we can buffer the video up that as well and have that running you know in a window on a host which is another advantage that's good if you don't happen to have the LCD or the other bits it means you can run um, you know, just by connecting up to your um, PC or whatever in the interim. Because all it's doing is it's effectively um, enumerating the VRAM over USB. And that's quite useful from a development point of view and a test point of view, among other things. Yeah, this is a really useful list. Enterprise 64, what was that? What was that from? System name. Oh, the Oric. I love the Oric. I always wanted one of those. And I, I couldn't, couldn't afford it, I remember. Two forty, two twenty four. Soft font. I got the Casio FX 9000B. Wow, this is a really good list, Laurie. Really handy.
excuse me. Excuse me a sec. Noisy foxes. This is a really good list, mate. Systems that could not be classified. A GET series. Arayo. Vector 06C. There's certainly a lot of commonality in some of these. Some are obviously much more obscure than others. screen off. Xerox Auto. Oh, wait a minute. I remember using one of those. I had to, um, years and years ago, in between, or was it when I was at university, I worked for this um, company in Brentford. And we used to sell, we, they used to sell lots of new stuff. Like um, they did a lot of um, business type machines. So it was a lot of Wang stuff, if you can remember all that. But we, the st they used to do part exchange and this was a big thing. They'd give some money back on the old stuff. And there was a whole lot of word processors and stuff used to come back in um, and I remember we got one of those Xerox machines they were incredibly heavy and complex and the connectors were bonkers but they were very cool they had this kind of graphical user interface I remember firing the thing up and having a play around with it In those days, a lot of my work, you know, as a kind of um, interim job between years, I used to have to do things like um, refurbish the old machines, realign the disk drives, and do all of that kind of stuff. You don't see many of those systems on this list. That was well before a lot of this, I guess. Most of them were like business machines for word processing and stuff. So you didn't have games and things on them. Cool. 
that's a really really uh, useful site thanks for that what's this restoring oh wow yeah look with the old portrait screens I remember that in fact that looks slightly different to the one that we had this is the um, I just want to see if that yeah you can see one of the connectors there bonkers connections very cool was that the only one they had we had a couple of different ones in was born Panasonic Jupiter hmm. Yeah, there's only one. They did others. That's going to be Wowzer. <laughs> the video brain. <laughs> wow. Oh, the Einstein, crikey. Nice. Um, yeah. I'm not suggesting that we support everything on that list. We couldn't anyhow. Some of them have too much, too high a video requirement in terms of memory and or resolution. But we could certainly support a bunch of them. Um, but the question is, yeah, where, where, where you split, you know, the HDL part from the, you know, the STM part. But I think there's some good mileage to be had here. Um, what would we tackle? We could be selective about what we tackle first, I guess. I mean, you're more familiar with the various different modes that are being used here than I am. But there are certain primitive mm -hmm. requirements.
time. Post. Um, what do you think, Laurie? I mean, there are some advantages. Chips like the MC6847 that is used by the Acorn Atom and lots of other machines could probably be down entirely on the STM32. Does it tell you? Um, I guess the ones that we probably want to focus on first would be the ones that are difficult to run on the ice 40 Any of them that we can fit in the existing memory of the ice 40 right, Are probably less important But once we start going beyond what's already in the ice 40 that's where we need the extra VRAM so you know, those could be prioritized, if you see what I mean. And they may be slightly less exotic. C64. If we look at all of these, if we just look, if we were to sort this by memory, you know, obviously something like that, I have no idea what that is, um, you wouldn't be able to fit in the ICE 40 memory. So you need to do something, right? Um, whereas the Apple One, you wouldn't. You could do all of that. Um, I don't know which ones to pick on here obviously the Z80 and Z81 are going to be easy to do in the internal memory anything with a relatively small the Apple II looks a bit tricky because that has slightly more memory I should imagine the ones with small amounts of memory are the less exotic ones. Um, are the more exotic ones in the way that they arrange stuff in order to achieve their goals. And yes, obviously certain chips. Again, we're not necessarily having the STM32 do, do everything that a chip does, but a lot in some cases. You can probably do a Spectrum entirely in VRAM. Well, a lot of these you could, potentially. Um, unfortunately, this is just showing video at the moment. You'd need to know how much RAM you need. Generally.
There's another way of looking at this as well. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I was just thinking. If you didn't add the memory mezzanine, and I need to come back to that, um, you could use the memory inside the STM32 as well. Although it would be a bit inefficient. But at the speeds that some of those early machines run, it probably wouldn't be an issue. The reads would be slower than the writes. There aren't many where the whole memory fits in VRAM other than the Z80, 81 Jupiter Racing, the ATRE 2600. Yeah. Apple two E at twenty seven K. Very odd. How many nines was it? Oh, it's two eighty by one nine two. FedEx Spectrum use in just under seven K. Interesting. Anyhow, I think it's an interesting option to be able to offer, I mean, it adds to the palette that we can draw on, I think. We probably want to be selective about what we supported, I think, like you say, if you go for the kind of common video chips that get you get some big wins you know quite simply but what do you think generally about the idea
Laurie says, yes, it's definitely an interesting option. Yes, I like the idea. Are you just suggesting it for driving the LCDs? Primarily, yes. I mean, you can actually have it do like a, a VGA thing. That's a bit more complicated because getting the timings right is um, tricky, but it is possible. Presumably wouldn't be fast enough for HDMI, correct? I don't think it could do HDMI. I don't think that would work. I mean, the primary thought here is really driving the LCDs rather than journal displays. But there are options for doing something like a VGA. Interestingly, there might also be some chips that convert, which I haven't looked at yet. Well, I had a look at the different um, LCDs available and it is just incredibly mind-bending, the selection. You know, from a simple 32240 all the way up to, I'll tell you what's popular is things like 800 by 480 and things like that. But, um, That's a bit more complicated if you go up to those resolutions. Because you obviously couldn't store all the pixels. Not at full colour. But um, you could have areas of the screen that were at effectively different um, bit resolutions and stuff. There's some tricks that you could pull to do your kind of menus and all that kind of stuff. Three twenty by two forty would do some, but all the required resolutions. Sure, but I was thinking of maybe getting something slightly higher resolution. And in most cases, when you're running the retro, you you would double up the pixels and stuff, or frame it, you know, to make it fit. Um, but it could be useful to have more resolution so that. Um, when you're running the game, when you want to do all your menus and stuff, you can do, um, you've got room to do that and still have the game playing and things. So you could have menus on the side and then the, uh, the game playing as a picture in picture, for example. Yeah, and that's the other advantage. If you do have a higher resolution screen, you can then cater for the higher resolution modes, albeit lower bit depths, which would be nice. There are, an all, uh, you know, I was looking through the screens. There is an awful lot out there that this could drive. Effectively, what we'd be driving it with is 
kind of 16 bit parallel. And that includes quite a lot of different displays. Let me just go and fill my wall for up. Give me a sec. back Let's check actually this thing doesn't update what we should do what is the uh, time? Um, it wouldn't do a BBC, I'm sorry, that's the old one. Laurie says an 800 by 480 display would be nice. Most ways of driving it would only need the amount of VRAM in that Wikipedia article. What? Yeah, I kind of think I understand what you're saying. I mean, you blow up, you know, the display to make it fit within that when you're, you know, operating it. But yeah, you know, a kind of three and a half, the four and a half inch screen would be lovely. I mean, you could have a proper stand up screen as well, but I'm just thinking for portability, given that it's going to fit on something that's that size. You know, if you diagonally half of that is about 10 to 11 you know that's about four inches just over and then you could have um, the other thing yeah yeah I should mention this the other thing I was thinking is uh, one of the things that I'm changing is uh, the mezzanine rather than it being long and narrow, actually goes on top of the board now and covers the whole 
whole caboodle. So you could have an LCD on top and then you can have buttons and stuff underneath if you want or controllers for doing gaming if you want to. There are all sorts of different things you could do. All sorts of possibilities that I've been playing around with. It'll work nicely with a larger LCD. It's just weird, I've just noticed. I'm going to my phone. Man, is that? This also makes all the interactive stuff better. So when it comes to loading thing, things off the disc, showing the options on the screen, the STM32 can do all of that directly, rather than indirectly, which is nice. Um, I'm just playing around with the USB. Hold on. Just looking at my USB. And it looks like it's connecting and then disconnecting. That's weird.
had this problem earlier when I was trying to use the um, TTY ACM because my keyboard appears as that sometimes and I managed to um, disable the, um, the driver for that which was um, a pain in the ass because I couldn't type in the terminal uh, Alright, the USB is working now. Which is good. Um, Lori says, this is a bit like the solution with the Game Dreno on the Black Ice 1 and 2. Yeah, I was thinking Game Dreno at the time and it could turn into something that's kind of similar to a soft Game Dreno but combined with some local HDL. Um, but the game Duino had a strange interface. Uh, this project has an 800 by 640. I'll have a look at that in a sec. The creator of that project had the start of a spinal HDL Game Boy implementation, which developed further quite a bit. Oi, Laurie developed further. Bear me just a sec, uh, like, because I'm just going to try something here. Um, what? Uh, AVCC tile. Confused. Um, I 
I'll come back to you in a sec, Laurie, on that. I just want to see if this works. Where's the tile coming from? Tile. I'm a bit confused now. Hold on just one second. This is something I really wanted to do here. I don't know why it's coming and going, but it's kind of worth it now. Um, the project has 800 by... So let's have a look at this. That looks kind of nice. Are using a zinc? Mm. Yeah, I've seen these displays. You can also get them with uh, touch, which is kind of nice. I think they're capacitive touch. Some of them come with resistive touch. Don't know why this. Frequency isn't stable. It's probably because I'm not using. Um, hmm. The right clock. EGA test pattern.
Uh, so you approve of the idea then, at least in theory. Uh, I'm just going to play with this, bear with me. Um, I want to split the screen, Laurie. How many pixels does this use? Uh, I forgot what mode I've got now. If it's 640 by 480. Um, so, these are the.
Mm. I just can't get my head around this at the moment. Why is that timing so bad? Why is it flickering behind me? It's really strange. It may be because I haven't fixed the uh, MCO yet. <laughs> Um, so on the, um, I'll come back to that. I'll get this working maybe by Friday if I get there. So on this touch screen, yeah, I mean, I saw some screens very similar to this one with capacitive touch, some with resistive. Um, the the thing that made it really difficult actually was the sheer volume of different LCDs available. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, a lot of those larger ones can be a problem though because some of them expect analog 24 bit. It looks very cool though. What size does he say that one is? Hold on. Yeah, I'm trying to avoid using Linux for doing any of this. It makes it more complicated. So, what should you say? It's a five inch. FBAs. They symbol it's giant parallel interface. There are twenty-four bits. Yeah, so this uses like the um do they call it analog? It's it's basically you drive it with a uh H sync, V sync and a dot clock, and then you have twenty-four bits, you know, eight for each colour. I wouldn't go for that because that's just excessive. I prefer a 16-bit uh, driver. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on, on on some of the micro uh, STM 32s, they support the LTD uh, graphics subset inside them, which are capable of supporting or driving these, but not on the one that we're using. But you can um, you can get um, sixteen bit driven versions. Right. Um, anything else that we needed to cover? How are we doing for time? It's ten o'clock. Yeah, I'm going to have to call it quits. Um, I might do some more on Friday, it depends how I go. Um, I'm currently working on the new routing um, that includes the um, the LCD connections. Uh, I was toying with the idea of putting a direct FPC connector on the ILB. But I'd rather have it on the mezzanine because we're going to require experimentation. And God, there's 
there is no standard for these damn connectors. They're all slightly different. Um, we might also want to include things like resistive or capacitive touch as well. So um, having it on a mezzanine means we can customize it to our needs by using a mezzanine that's designed to go with one or several different LCDs uh, and or a touchscreen. On the touchscreen front, you can use, they, they, they normally require you to use like an analog input. So what I might do is run not only the LCD interface up to the mezzanine, but also some analog pins, maybe to enable us to possibly use a touch, touch screen. And it can then translate those into, you know, commands. I mean, for selecting different disk images and stuff, you wouldn't need that, but um, we can use it as an input command for some of the other stuff. You could even have an on-screen keyboard if you so wished. Anyhow, I'm going to leave it there unless you've got any further questions. Thanks for your help today, Laurie. I'm glad you like the idea. I just want to utilise the STM32 that we've got on board because it's it's got some really good features. Uh, it's really powerful and it's got all that SRAM just kicking around waiting to be used for something. And it just strikes me that that is a much better use of it. Um, and that the LCD output is much better than, you know, the parallel LC output is much better than using, say, adding an SD RAM chip onto it. Much more useful for our situation. So I'm going to go with that for now, unless I discover any big issues. Uh, and then we can start, um, when I order the boards, we can start um, having a play around with it which will be cool. Right, so uh, until the next stream then, um, ciao, take care of yourself, best wishes, good luck to everyone in Ukraine, I hope they get through all of this uh, terrible um, invasion. I hate Putin so much. Anyhow, ciao, I will see you soon.